We, uh, Sister Bethany gave you all a good report from last week. Thank you. She says you're a lot brighter group than the Watertown people, and I do. <laughs> Sister. You're a lot sharper. Oh, is this recording? <laughs> oh, yeah. You know this. Not to be seen by the people who want to be. We all have our college bar that bomb. I know. I mean, I'm looking around. She said only a couple of people gave her trouble. We all recycled. So there were no referrals. See, we learned. She brought you, uh, she no, brought you no. cups? Recyclable stuff. Water. Were you Instead of using cups for coffee, yeah. we're going to throw away our carbon footprint. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. She'd, be, she'd be writing me citations all, all day long. <laughs> Sorry, I tell her that. Yeah, you know. me too. Most of it's washed here tonight. <laughs> and walking home too, pretty much. It's a long way. So, uh, so that was uh, she, she filled me in on, on what was going on and all that. And uh, and now the paper. Just so we have an understanding. Some of you turned the paper into me today. I'm not looking for a lot of citations on that. Don't worry about giving me the exact article and, and the date and all that. Or if you used a book. But if you quote something, I, I want to know where it came from, and where the page is, and what the citation is. No, it does not have to be in the Chicago format or uh, you know uh, American site format or whatever. But tell me the book, the author, uh, and the page number in the in the year. That's all. It doesn't have to be you know, period year comma uh, If you use an online article, uh, just cite the source, cite the website that you used. Okay. What I'm really looking for in these papers is your personal grasp of the social justice issue that you're writing about, okay? So if, for example, you're writing about, let's just say, death penalty, something grabbed you about the death penalty, maybe it was the, the uh, Boston Marathon bomber, could be that that's going on, that you're not giving me an academic overview of the death penalty, but your personal reflections on that. Okay? You, you, you grasp what I'm saying? Uh -huh. what, you, what is your faith informing you about that social justice issue? If it's about world hunger, hunger, if it's about dignity of the human person, whatever issue you're writing on and you're using some anecdotal or story to support that, then I want you to be able to show me through that two to three page paper, doesn't that be very long, that you grasp the faith concepts and the teachings of the church involved in that issue. Okay? Mm -hmm. You want to cite scripture? That's fine. Uh, in fact, I would encourage that. But, uh, you know, all you have to do to tell me about scripture is the version of, of the New Testament that you're taking it from. If you want to give it to me in Greek or Latin, that's fine. <laughs> Just translate it too. Just translate it too. <laughs> Latin ain't what it used to do. Okay. So, any questions on the assignment itself that are due next week? Now, if you need an extension, you ought to be asking for that now. <laughs> and uh, there isn't a lot of time to, to, you know, grant an extension because you've got your retreat, you've got another workshop in May, you've got a year-end packet that has to be done, so don't think you've got a whole month to do a paper because really, quite honestly, that month will go very, very quickly. So uh, if you have any problems getting that assignment into me, let me know. Okay, so what we're going to do tonight is the first uh, 45 minutes or so before break, I'm going to cover... Uh, rights of workers. I'm going to cover that particular social justice issue and we will go through that. In the second half, we're going to go back into our groups. Uh, we just continued that group last week. Sister Bethany did uh, a group, I understand, with you on uh, uh, the carbon footprint and, and that sort of thing. But we're going to go back into our groups for one last time uh, in the second half of this. And what I'm going to ask your groups to do in the, in the second half is to go back Revisit the issue you have within your parish. No, I haven't changed it up this time like I did last time. But I'm going to ask you to get serious about proposing a parish program or a parish strategy 
that we will share next week in the second half of, of the class, where you'll get up and say, okay, here's the problem, uh, here's what we discussed. Here, you remember the, the worksheet that I gave you? Mm -hmm. You're gonna follow that format, and your leader or your leaders, however you wanna present it next week, you can show a PowerPoint if you want to, but you're gonna have about 10 or 15 minutes for each group to share the outcome of, of your social justice issue that you dealt with in your parish. So get prepared in your groups tonight, discuss how you wanna do that. But before you decide how you wanna present it, have something to present. I mean, that's always a good idea to have uh, a strategy. So uh, you can uh, decide to do that. And then we'll talk a little bit more about what we're gonna do the last <coughs> week, the theological reflection, what, what I mean uh, by doing a theological reflection on social justice. Okay. Uh, any questions? Is it pretty clear? Mm -hmm. uh, so tonight we're going to cover uh, the Catholic social teaching piece of the rights and dignities of, of workers. Why is that frozen? I did that the first week too, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Freezes yeah. on the screen. Said sister had trouble last week with the sound. Now, uh, while this is rebooting, I hope you're keeping up on your your reading. It's an awful lot of reading if you're not reading the one chapter a week. It'll get it'll get pretty uh, pretty cumbersome for you. Uh, particularly with the reference uh, to, to the documents that I'm going to be doing tonight. Th this presentation is going to walk you through the documents. I don't expect that you're, you're going to be able to digest all these documents. That's 125 years of church history. So certainly not asking you to know the particulars of each, each document. But, but you need to know the, the fact that these documents guide our social justice strategies in the church, and that our thinking within the church evolves uh, from, let's call the starting point, 1893 in Rerum Navarre, to as recently as uh, Pope John, John Paul's document in 1991. <coughs> yeah. You know what this is not? Randy, did it take that long to fire up last week? It took a while for it to come up, but uh, this is a little bit longer than it took last week. Yeah. You may need a new bulb. It should be coming up by now. That. We got a little yeah. color now. Okay. If you pause that. Yeah, good idea. If we're looking at social justice issues, are you with me? Yeah. Uh, what challenges, this is week six, that 
the, the, the issues we've been talking about, what challenges have you personally faced with these teachings? And if your answer is, oh, I live these teachings all the time, you're one in a million, maybe one in a billion, but aren't you? What challenges you? Your own, your own personal opinions. When you, when you see something that, that makes your blood boil on TV or, or whatever, you know, that, that, uh, that it, it's hard not to get personally involved. It's hard not to get angry or judgmental. Okay. Yeah. You know, okay. You, so your, your own personal feelings get in the way. What else? What challenges? The magnitude of it, the scope of it. Where do I start? Yeah, and then you feel guilt. I feel guilty because I don't feel I'm doing enough. Yeah. You know, and yet I'm thinking, but what can I do? It's not like I'm a politician, and it's not like I'm, quote, anybody. And I try to do it, like, maybe in my home or in my classroom or something like that. Right. We're called to understand the teachings of our church. And we're called to put into action what we're possibly able to do within our own parishes. We're, we're, not, we're not called to go out and cure world, world hunger, right? We're, we're not called uh, necessarily, at least I don't think any of us are, uh, called to, to overhaul the whole dignity to life issue that we've been struggling in this country with for, for decades, if not centuries. We are called to understand what our church teaches. And then, through that lens of Catholic social teaching, implement it in the world with which we live, in which we live. That might be our parish life. And that gets to the next point, to your organization. Well, sometimes your organization uh, is your parish. But let's not assume that that's your only organization. Obviously, family is the domestic church. That's going to come first. Certainly, your parish. But Anne's talking about her school. That's her organization. How many of you work in a hospital? All right, it becomes a hospital. How many work in a nursing home or extended care or other social service agency? The thing is, I worked in the city for 40 years, and people don't realize how many things you can volunteer for, like when there's an oil problem and they need a committee in order to discuss yeah. it. And there's a lot of things in the city you don't have more than you do in the town. Right? But it, there are always groups that need people. And but first you have to understand the church's view of it in yeah. order to follow. Volunteerism is a strategy for putting the teachings of the Catholic Church into place. But Catholic social teaching is not, by on its face, volunteerism. Mm -hmm. <coughs> right? These Catholic social teachings that we've been following the last number of weeks are not all about how to motivate people to volunteer to do more in their parishes. It is to prepare you for ministry that you can prayerfully approach these issues in the world and begin to understand what your calling is and what you can do. It's overwhelming. I, I agree. The scope of it is just, uh, it's amazing. So this is a PowerPoint that, that I stole some stuff from Catholic uh, East, Catholic Health East. It was basically around the idea of Catholic health care. Um, focus this off just a little bit. These are the documents, if you've been reading your book, and I hope you all have, that are referenced in those little thumbnails in the beginning, in the, all these documents. Rerum Novarum Quadragesimo Anima, oh, which was an update of the Rerum Novarum after 40 years, that's what that means. Uh, Pachina Terras, uh, Moderate Magistra, Gaudium et Spes, which we covered when I did uh, Ecclesiology uh, a year or so ago. Uh, Popularum Progresso, Progressio. Justice in the world. Uh, later, now we're moving along here, and we're going to get into why we're doing this. 
just a second. These are all the documents that have to do with social justice. Not to mention encyclicals that reference it, but those that are dedicated particularly is our church right here. So, so if you hear people saying, well, look at that Catholic church, they don't do anything in the world. They don't go out Well, it's not what we're taught. It's not what we're being told to do. Whether we follow it or not is a whole different thing. But where we start over here at Rerum Novarum and where we end up with Centesimus Annus, there's an evolution of thought here. The Catholic teachings themselves, those social justice uh, concepts, remain the same. Nowhere in here, when you look at the first of those eight social justice concepts, in particular the ones that we've already dealt with, dignity of the human person, subsidiarity, solidarity, rights and uh, dignity of the, of the worker, uh, all of these things don't change over the last 125 years. The strategies do, and the references to certain practices as we'll see in the idea of unions, okay, that are first called associations, later called unions, back to associations. Why is that? Is that because the Catholic Church changed its view on unions? Or did the cultural context change what unions were? Yeah. So these are the documents. Uh, the ones that are primary at the end, I'm going to focus on are Rerum Novarum, Gaudi Mitzvahs, and Economic Justice for All. Now there's a way of looking at the documents. I want to give you this framework. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it when break hits and hit. But there's four lenses that you want to look. If you took any of these documents and broke it down, you'd want to look at the historical background. You'd want to look at context. You'd want to look at the main points of the document. And you'd want to look at innovation. There's another way of looking at this. Historical background is looking at the past. What has happened in the past to lead the church to this point to make a statement on this social justice issue? That's first. Past. Present. What is happening right now to make this Catholic social teaching relevant? Why not? Why is the Pope, why was Pope Leo XIII talking out on labor abuse, child labor, uh, inadequate wages being paid, so on? Main points, what are the strategies of that document? What does it propose, what does the document propose that we do? And finally, innovation. It's a way of looking toward the future. It's a way of saying, if we take these main points, we implement, we change our practices, we change our strategy, what will we change in the world relative to this social justice issue? Okay? Mm -hmm. So let's, let's take one apart, for example. Rerum Navarro. Written in... 18... Oh, yeah, 1891. <coughs> okay. So the historical background, what, what led up to the point? Why Rerum Novarum? Why did, why did Pope Leo XIII sit down with all his advisors and say, we've got to do something here? What was it? What were the problems? Justice for the Speak it out again. Justice, justice for the workers. Child labor wages. abuse, low inadequate low wages. What else? Justice, justice for the workers. Just, there was no justice for the workers, right? Workers. What else? Unsafe conditions. Unsafe conditions. Remember our movie. Right? Anything else? Okay. The right so what was the context? The rights of workers? To some degree. But what was the context of Rerum Navarum? 1891, what was going on? The Industrial Revolution. Industrial start Revolution. Factory work. Okay. What else? Carol? No, I'm just repeating. What did Industrial Revolution bring? Safe working conditions, clean air, clean water? What? Tell me. Factory, factory work, sm Factories. smoke, pollution. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, so, so the context of it was a lot of bad things that came along with the ironically entitled Industrial Revolution. Right. Uh, 
the main points, I think we've covered some of those here. What did the document say we should do versus what we shouldn't do? What about child labor? More kids? We should get more labor? <coughs> Work them longer hours. Longer hours. They're kids. They got That's more right. energy. Yeah, they, energy. Yeah. they don't need as many breaks. They need <laughs> recess, but not breaks. Uh, no, what was it? What was the issue? What was the strategy? Set, set no, rules. Set, the, set rules that were that were safe. And safe child and, labor was a no go. And, yeah. Child, child. Children should not be exploited. Right. And innovation. What did if we were to look at Rara Navarro, what did it move us toward? Did it move us toward anything? Stuff like Labor unions. Uh, yeah. OSHA. Unions, <laughs> associations. <laughs> right. OSHA. Ro robots. Strength, strength in numbers. <laughs> the Catholic Church steps out there and believes in these things and hopefully it changes the way we look at labor. Did it immediately change it? No. Rara Navarro asserted rights to work, just wage, the right to join associations. Remember, not called unions yet. Right. Called associations, the right to associate. Just wage, though, was defined as a certain floor below which especially the poor cannot fall. Two cents an hour was not enough. It wasn't up to the employer, the corporate people, the owners, the, to determine that wage. There was a generally accepted idea of what a wage should be, and that it should be just in its ability, and it should have an ability to support the family. It emphasized the duties of worker, no violence in respecting property. You couldn't get mad at your employer and go towards the place. <coughs> and justify it and say, Jesus made me do it. You couldn't do that. Uh, and employers needed to provide a safe workplace. So the church was very clear on this, that, that there's no violence, there's a respecting of property on the part of the employee, but on the part of the employer, there needed to be a safe workplace. This sounds a lot like what? Give me the word. Old Testament, New Testament, something that starts on page one of Genesis and it hasn't ended yet. This is what? What kind of relationship? Man. Love of neighbor. Speak right up. Love of neighbor. Kind of, but it's it's a term that we use throughout our faith. Covenant. Oh, covenant. It's a covenantal relationship. It is more than a contract, it is understood that you're doing this and I'm doing this. That's how our church approaches these issues. It asserted the dignity of work, that work by itself is a spiritual good. So the rights of workers, Catholic social teaching, if we were to really break it down, Church's teaching on labor is developed in response to concrete realities within society. Those constants mean that there's a dignity of the worker and work. There is a common good of the culture that's made up by the worker and subsidiarity and participation. Have we not been talking about subsidiarity to almost make us not want to talk about it? But, but that's, that's at the basis for almost all of Catholic social teaching. So the history and context of Rarum began with the Industrial Revolution. It was a response to Marxism, that whole idea of collective ownership. The church said, no, no, the right to own property is absolute. It's God-given right. That comes out of Jewish law, comes out of Old Testament law. Uh, the plight of the workers, especially children, was addressed. The dignity of workers, the ability to obtain work. That's also in there, that a, a society has to create opportunity for work, right? Because work is an integral part of human dignity. Now, um, let's stop there. Is that, we grasp the, the idea here? What would Torkoff talk to the 13 so much that he would write a 25 page document, put it out to the world? Yeah. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Over here. <laughs> 
No, I know I was looking at the screen, but I, I know who it was. Yeah. The, the part where Doris, go ahead. The right to, <laughs> uh, it says the right to own property. Does that mean, you mean uh, regular people couldn't? Is that just in Europe, or is that everywhere? No. It, the church defends the right to own property. In other words, you're going to Rivera and Navarum and moving forward. The right to own property is absolute, okay? Wages are paid to the person so that it gives them the ability to buy stuff, to own property, to own clothes. Marxism was saying, no, you can't do that. You can't. It's community. We all share in that. Now, it sounded like a great idea. The church was, was going away from Marxism and saying, no, you have a right to own what you want to own. However, to, to build on what Carol's saying, you can own it, but you have responsibility right. to manage what you own. So, you have a right to own, but you can't go out and own everything. You can't own all the land, buy up all the land, because you've got the preferential option for the poor, right? You see how Catholic social teachings, certain ones, and including documents like encyclicals and things like that, are kept honest by other social justice concepts. So yes, there's a right to own, that's absolute, but you've also got responsibility for the poor. So, so you still have a responsibility to, to give back to the church, to, to, to the collection, for instance, uh, you know how like even, even back the Acts of the Apostles was just reading today there, they, they sold some of the stuff they had and they gave the money back, they, gave, they, they pitched it into a big pot and helped out the poor and stuff like that. That's what yeah, that It's very difficult to isolate the social justice teaching. If you have the right to own, it doesn't mean you can go out and own everything and therefore deny others their right to own as well. Right? Uh, getting to the nature of work and tradition. The, the important piece of, of all that was not so much that the, the church was getting into the labor union business, but they were trying to, we were trying to as a church 125 or so years ago, talk about that the worker, there's a dignity to the worker, the worker is not a commodity. The worker is not just simply uh, something we need to get profit. So we go out and hire a bunch of workers, we pay them very little, next to nothing, they produce a product, people make a lot of money off of the product and, and buy a lot of stuff and so on. No, there was a the worker, there's a dignity of the worker, the worker's not a commodity. And this gets us into dignity of work today, I put this in here because it's part of theirs. Um, we have to participate in the ministry of healing now, not healing in the sense that we're all going to go out and become doctors or nurses. Healing a broken culture, I assume, is why all of you are called to ministry. It's hard to escape that we're not just called to ministry because we've got a lot of certificates to give out. And this is the easiest way to do that. No, you're called to ministry to, to, to heal what is broken, to fix what is broken in a world that doesn't really live by these eight concepts or these teachings that we've been talking about the last few weeks. And so we're directed to go and stand on the side of the most vulnerable, the voiceless, which in 1891 happened to be the worker. The worker had no rights. Work for the common good. All of your groups tonight are dealing with the issue of what is the common good. Subsidiarity cannot be separated from this. Because if you are going to make decisions at the most appropriate level, I don't want to say the lowest level, because that's not what we're talking about, but the most appropriate level, then you have to be able to talk about the common good and understand what that common good is. So the respect, the dignity, and collaboration are absolutely essential for any of these concepts, in particular, uh, the dignity of, and rights of the worker. Violence, intimidation, power plays are not acceptable. We don't have any of that today anyway. Fortunately, we've grown away from this, right? 
The workplace is a safe place, right? There's no intimidation, right? Right. Just want to make sure. Forty years later, Quadra GC. I'm going to whip right through these now, so you can connect the dots. Quadra GC up in Romano on a reconstruction of the social order came out in 1931. Forty years after Pope Leo the Thirteenth wrote Rerum Nirvana. What were we dealing with then? We're dealing with the same issues. The same Catholic social teaching moves forward. But what have you got? But the depression. Mm -hmm. right? The market collapsed in 1929. World War One. Is still, you know, there was still the world is still recovering from that, and you've got fascism. So this document has to not so much reinvent itself, but it now has to address some new realities that didn't exist when Pope Leo the Thirteenth and his collaborators wrote Rerum Navarre. And this one defended the right to organize. It spoke of associations. Unions were not yet emphasized. We're, we're calling them unions at this point. It promoted subsidiarity, decision-making at an appropriate level. This is what I said. The just wage should consider, I forgot to throw the rest of that in. It should consider the needs of the worker. In other words, the just wage, according to after 40 years, quadragissimo anno, should not just be arbitrarily decided on what will maximize the profit, but it should look at the fairness of the wage based on the work that's being performed. We take that for granted today, don't we? When we look at minimum wage, we're fighting over minimum wage right now. That keeps going up and up and up, but this is at a time when there wasn't really a minimum wage. We're talking about a fair wage. That's a different concept. It hadn't evolved yet. <clears throat> so what has to be taken into consideration for a wage set is a firm's capacity for survival, social provisions should assure that it's being paid, that it must be considered again for the common good. All right, so we go to moderate majesty. Again, just wages throughout this. But there is a difference here. We start talking about the global common good. We start talking about the relationship between workers and employer employers that are marked by goodwill. So it's an expansion of what we had in Quadragissimo Anno. And, and again, the participation in associations. I realize I'm going through these quickly, but Mater et Magistra had a little different spin to it. There was a commitment to peace. Began to look at work, the relationship between the worker and the employer as, as being a commitment to peaceful coexistence protection of the environment, the organization of the state's power. Now we're in the 1940s, 50s, I don't have the date right there. But it, but it evolved, might even be 65 on this one. Provision of essential services. Now I put this on here. This is very important because our world has evolved <coughs> in the last 50 years. I might be the oldest one in the room. Not really. I don't think so. I'm one of the oldest ones in the world. And I remember when health insurance was just a given. It was just part of it. My first job, oh yeah, and you get health insurance. I'd rather have the money. Back then, you get Blue Cross, Blue Shield. What's happened to that? Obamacare. I can't blame it on Obamacare. Oh no. Health insurance went out of the package a long yeah, time a ago. Long time ago. And it went out without so much as a whimper. As a whimper. It began to disappear. It came in with a copay. And those copays were small. Right? Five percent. Ninety-five percent is paid by the employer. Five percent. That's all you have to pay. What are we paying now? Ten, fifteen, twenty. 50, if, yeah, if, if you get lucky. Right. We, we lay it on Obamacare. <coughs> Not to pick on you, Donna, but that's the quickest. We're, <coughs> we're always quick with going to the most recent yeah. and rather than going back. And if you do that, if you look at Obamacare or you look at you know, the most recent event and you look at that, you will be too far away from the Catholic social teaching to remind you that if you don't adhere to these things, 
I don't understand. They drift Obama away. Care from Canada. <laughs> well, Obamacare is a band aid. Oh, okay. For all intents and purposes. Why do we need Obamacare? Let's just throw what, what social justice issue, not Catholic social justice, but what social justice issue is Obamacare trying to address? Healthcare for lack of health care. Lack of health care. All right? What else about health care? Lack of health care. What's the issue with lack of health care? Is it available? It was, it's expensive. It was, yeah. That's right. Too expensive. And so people are opting out of it. What's that? It's not always available. That's yeah. Yeah, you're right. That's a big Right. But is it the affordability of health care or is it we don't have health care? What is Obamacare or anything like that trying to fix? The affordability. The affordability of it. Okay. So going back 40 or so years, when I got my first job, health care was automatically in the package. It wasn't a matter of affordable. Why was it affordable then and it isn't affordable now? Is that because of the population, maybe? That should make it cheaper. Stuff, cost, stuff was cheaper? Rising cost. The medical industry has just boom. The cost of everything has gone crazy. Back from when, just before Medicare, in 1965, was instituted. And you know, there was a very small number of, of prescription drugs as opposed to today. Yeah, just it's just astronomical. Right. It's, it's it's hard to believe. You know, there was that. Oh, somebody else is going to pay. We can develop. So as our technological advancements <coughs> and advancements in chemotherapy and so on, in the pharmaceutical industry, the cost of care went up. The you know insurance what? companies can't keep pace with that, right? You know what kills me though is the cost of uh, people getting treatment for cancer and so. I mean, what the heck? You can't afford it. Well, yeah. The drugs cost a lot of money. Yeah, uh, agree. And so, and so I think what we see here is a social justice issue. The reason I put these on here is that at one point we believed, at the time of the writing of moderate magistrate, that the employer had to be concerned about all of these issues. The dignity of the worker included that they be assured they had food, housing, education, access to culture. I don't know what that means. Mets tickets, I don't know. <laughs> Transportation, basic health care, freedom of communication, expression, protection of religious freedoms. I'm not making this stuff up. That's not my list. That's a list of one at one time. It was expected that employers should be concerned about all those issues for anybody that they employ. Are they still Some of them aren't even there now. All those? No, because no, that protection of religious freedom. Yeah. Oh, no. Say that's, gone. that's what I'm yeah. saying to you, yeah. is that this has disappeared from the landscape over not that long of a period of time. No. Right. All right. And we are Catholics, and we should be you know, reacting to this, saying that's not what our church teaches. And it's not. Donahue's idea that these things should be on there, it was in the document, Moderate Magistrate. Church in the Modern World, 1963, we covered this in Ecclesiology, but human labor is superior to other tools of economic activity. The right to found and join labor unions. Union shows up in the language. Why? It's okay. Unions have evolved to a point where you can use that term. Rights to goods, are sufficient for self and family. We wouldn't have had to address all of these had there not been a problem with always trying to take the profit first. Mm -hmm. And so a, a, an element of greed comes in here. And, and greed, greed is insidious. You know, let's, let's agree that as Catholics, the problem we have with Catholic social teachings are so many of the problems we're facing are insidious kinds of problems. Uh, Greed, racism, these are not highly visible. There's not a lot of proof on this, right? We look at behaviors, we try to determine what's really going on. And so we're looking at dialogue. And then in, in uh, Popular and Progresso, Pro Progressio, we are looking more at a global market. 
Okay, and I'm just going to skip through some of these because we've got lost some time. But what I want to say with all of these is that they are knitted together. What you can see as you go through all of these documents is a maturation of our church. The teaching itself does not change, but the strategies do. The language changes. And 1991, John Paul II, after 100 years, now what had happened, communism had collapsed. We don't talk about Marxism the way we used to back in 1891. Now we got a crowd of capitalism, right, which we thought was the answer to Marxism. Just wage is not a market wage. It's important to realize that the just wage does not emerge out of the marketplace as what is payable. It has to pre-exist that. This is very important to look at after 100 years. Work is a human response to God's gifts. Isn't that nice language? Yes. It makes us look at jobs differently. It makes us look at our work differently. It makes us look at our work as vocational and not just simply taking a job that's available. And then workers can express themselves through unions. Um, okay, so ways of summarizing here. The church teaching calls for the right to work, a safe workplace, just wages, a right to a voice in the workplace, subsidiarity, a right to join or not join associations slash unions, promotion of subsidiarity and participation, dignity of work, greed, violence, coercion are unacceptable. I guess this was before Wall Street existed, but it's a tough one in today's culture. How do we as Catholics struggle with this teaching? Greed, violence, and coercion are unacceptable. Encourage participation by the worker. Tell that to the summer brothers. What's that? Tell that to the book brothers. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. So here's the main point I'm trying to make of all these documents, to knit them together, is to not say that one document is better than all others. In fact, if we start with Brera and Navarro, and we're, again, we're only talking about social justice here. If we were talking about ecclesiology, or we were talking about uh, the sacramental life of the church, I would be proposing other documents here. But because we're talking about social justice, Catholic social justice, I'm showing you that these 12 documents are knit together very neatly. And sometimes the language is repeated in the documents, and sometimes one document builds on another one and takes a problem that has emerged since the last document and proposes a new strategy. This is the issue. Strong themes and some constants that cover a period of over 150 years of theological reflection. This isn't bunch of sociologists getting together in a room in the Vatican and deciding what human nature has brought us to. This is based on the teachings of Jesus Christ. Right? They're built on how God has revealed the revelatory revelation and how we should be securing the rights and, based, and protecting basic human rights. Okay. So, we got about eight minutes there. I threw two, uh, two of these, uh, three of these issues up there. For those of you that hadn't done your papers yet, I thought, well, let's throw three social justice issues that are relatively new. All right? Relatively new. The South Carolina shooting that happened a week or so ago, right? Mm -hmm. uh, everybody's aware of that story. Okay. And the cop shoots the guy in the back five, six times, then picks up the taser, drops it next to the body. And all of this is being filmed by the guy with the cell phone. So if this technology doesn't exist, what I consider to be blatant racism, violence, discriminatory violence, goes unchecked, right? Mm -hmm. How would you know? 
On-call workers is another issue that's coming up. It fits into tonight. Do you know what the on-call worker deal is? What is it, Rod? How does that work? Basically, uh, people have to. Well, the way I heard it, and it was NPR, the, the segment said that it was more prevalent in the clothing industries and, and things like that, retail industries. Right. And that they would, uh, the worker would have to either call in or they'd get a text or an email, you can come to work today. Um, or not. The interesting thing I didn't realize, and, and I've been involved in union stuff for well over 20 years, is that New York has a law that you have to pay four hours if, if you're called off like that. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. that, that was really interesting. I didn't know that. Somehow missed that. What would you say, how many understand what the on-call worker problem is? Okay, in a nutshell, <coughs> it is avoiding the whole minimum wage thing altogether. That you basically employ a person, but you don't have to provide them hours or guarantee them a day's or a week's pay. You get around that by basically having them be on call. If I need you, I'll call you. If not, there's no work for today. Now, my question to you would be, just in that little brief thumbnail that I gave you, does that fit Catholic social teaching in terms of what, would, would the church be okay with it? No, no, no. no. Because injustice. Well, yes, he has a right to right week or whatever. Yeah. No, earn no, 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 no. To support himself and his family or whatever. Okay, so it, on, the, on the fair wage issue alone, yes. it hits it because it skirts fair wage. Don? I totally agree with what she said. Is that what you were saying? <laughs> Your point? Somebody else over here was saying that. There. There's injustice in there because they're not giving them a ample time, like a, a full week's work, and uh, right. they're kind of calling them as they need them, and then, I mean, and they don't call them I would, again if they I would take the job. They don't call them again if they don't come. They go to the bottom of the list, and then the other people that are coming come That's in, right. and they don't recall them. <clears throat> what did Rod say about the, the New York State law, the four-hour? It's a four-hour minimum. You have to pay. If somebody's on on-call status, you have to guarantee four hours of paid work. So, Somebody's in a job that has eight hours. If if you're going to reduce them to on call, you're going to save four hours of wage being paid to the. Uh, now, employee. what happens to the the? Where do we fit in with the idea that that person is happy with just getting four hours wage and doing nothing, basically? The church wouldn't address that issue. The church would address it as a broad practice. And it would address it as the social injustice of it. You say to me, well, I'd rather just have work four hours and, and work on my golf game the other four hours. That's fine. There's no injustice there, right? But this has become a practice within certain industries to avoid paying full-time wages. <laughs> and it's skirting the law. And unfortunately, in our country right now, these are the kinds of things that happen. We don't know how they do. And the church, all, all <coughs> lay, lay ministers, doesn't necessarily speak out on these issues. Like we won't see an encyclical on on-call workers, but it's an issue that's coming up and that will require some sort of statement. It will also address require it. some kind of, um, because I would, I would think, go mutual-wise, on-call. What if you have a family, a, a family of seven or something, and the, and the man and wife who's a, a big family, and the man or the woman, or both of them are on call, say, yeah. and they don't work. Now, they're waiting to work. One day goes by, there's no work. Two days goes by, there's no work. There's children that have to be fed. Now, that would also bring about anxiety. Well, sure, and, and that gets into those abuse. other lists that I put there that the employer yeah. should, according to Catholic social mm -hmm. teaching, be concerned with all those other areas, too. Well, but, the other well problem, by and large, they are not. The other problem is, is that if they're not going to give them an equal wage or a decent wage, they have to pay. They have to pay for fuel to get themselves to their jobs. Right. But this avoids unemployment. You haven't laid anybody off. Uh, right. A lot of issues. Yeah. Oh yeah. Health. You're not paying health care. You're not paying uh, workers' comp. There's a whole bunch of things in here that you're able to skirt. Because of the non-call scale, people people no, are so desperate for that work. Because I think this is an emerging social issue yep. that that we will have to address. 
the on-call workers. The shooting sets the stage for this. This is a whole new form of social justice that's coming out right now. And that is the cell phone, the smartphone. The guy that pulls this cell phone out and, and records the officer in the shooting uh, is just using technology. The minute that person turns it over to the family of the victim, you're addressing a social, well, you didn't turn it over to the cops, you turned it over to the family. Now you're addressing a social justice issue. You see the difference? See the difference? If you're taking this whole thing, you're recording it on your cell phone, and you go out and get a couple of pitches of beer, and you, you watch the video and say, hey, where do you see this? That's not, that's not social justice, right? If your intent of recording, of using that media to right a wrong, to call into brighter light a social injustice, now you've got a whole new way of doing social justice that didn't exist. It didn't exist 10, 15, 20 years ago, really. Did you just hear the example of what you're talking about? I think it was on yesterday's news. There was a gang rape on a beach. There were nine That's men right. or young men raping a girl that was unconscious. And recording it. And they recorded it, and they were yeah. drinking yep. their beer and laughing, and all of this was recorded. They're posting it to video How sites and everything yeah. else. Yeah, they record yeah. themselves. So, so the use of the technology in and of itself does not address Catholic social justice. It doesn't make it a justful act. Mm -hmm. But it's what is done with that technology that may open up some doors to address some, some very serious issues. Well, today, just today on TV, I saw a black American. Uh, he, I don't know, I because I, I caught it halfway through it, but he was talking about, he was stopped by the cops for, fun, for some particular reason. It happened to be a white cop, white cop on a black, black person being stopped. And, yes. and, and he taped it or, with his phone, the whole thing, and the cop was, uh, there was nothing bad about the whole situation. He was just trying to get a uh, message across to everybody that, that not, not all cops are bad. Right. Right. That was on Facebook. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, think, I think what we're finding with this, this kind of thing is that, yes, it does unearth <coughs> some, some, some real nasty stuff, some real injustices. But then it also points to the fact that, you know, if you're going to use body cams and you're going to use a lot of those things, I don't know, you're, you're a policeman or a detective, though, right? Oh. Investigator. <coughs> okay, so there's got to be issues around the whole use of body cams, too. All sorts of privacy issues. As soon as you're going to somebody's residence, right. you're recording. That's right. What we would normally need to search for. That's right. That's right. So it, it, there's a whole other bunch of issues with that. And I wouldn't even begin to address the issues around the body cams as a social justice issue. But I am here, here to say to you that, that there are some emerging uh, stories of courage that are coming out of these things and people really standing up and, and doing the right thing. Uh, and I think we, we have to look at that. And then the, the last thing I would say to you before break, you know, the whole issue around um, the, the Boston bombings, you know, whether there's a death penalty or, or whether there should be a death penalty, I want to remind you and I'm doing it in a way that's not saying, oh, just remember that once you're commissioned, you have to go with church teachings. But know what the teachings are. All right? As a lay minister, I'm here to tell you that whether you feel that your status has been elevated, it has been. As a commissioned lay minister, your status has changed within your church whether you feel it or not. Your status within your parish has changed. People know that you became a commissioned lay minister. So when you engage in conversations, be careful that your personal opinion doesn't drive the conversation to the point where your opinion is counter to Catholic social teaching. I'm not going to have a, raise of, a show of hands how many people think that the Boston bombers should be executed. But our own bishop wrote, in our North Country Catholic about capital punishment, I felt I needed to, to read this. Why? Because we're tempted at times to say, well, you know what I think. 
I think oh, an eye for an eye. That's what, that's what Jesus said. <laughs> I've heard a lot of people say that. Jesus said an eye for an eye. Tooth for a tooth. Um, on capital punishment, our own bishop wrote, Catholic teaching makes the distinction between society's right to inflict the death penalty and the need for us to do so. As the Catechism of the Catholic Church states, the traditional teaching of the Church does not exclude recourse to the death penalty if this is the only possible way of effective, effectively defending human lives against the unjust aggressor. The need is, however, practically non-existent today because of the possibilities which the state has for effectively rendering a criminal incapable of doing further harm. The death penalty re deceives us into thinking that we can defend life by taking life. Retribution, just punishment, and revenge are not found among the list of Christian virtues. Ultimately, God alone punishes evil doers. That's our bishop today. The Pope came out. Did you see the one from the Pope mm -hmm. saying how to hand that we should do something to handle ISIS? That when it is something that is so evil that there is an evil in the world that we must do something as well, Christians. But this isn't that. No, yeah. I know. But I'm, talking I'm talking about capital punishment. You're talking about just war. <laughs> yeah, right, but I was surprised that he did that. Well, the just war theory has been around for a long time. I mean, going back to Augustine. <coughs> but when we're look, looking at capital punishment, and that's in the news, and you found, find yourself engaged in conversation about should we or shouldn't we know what the teaching is, more so know what your bishop teaches. Mm -hmm. That's important for lay ministers. It's important for deacons. It's important for priests. It's necessary for all of ministry to know what their leadership is saying. And finally, that we are not called to ministry because we're so smart. We're so brilliant, <laughs> we're so innovative that nobody has ever thought of this stuff before. And now the world needs us to say what is on our mind. That's not what ministry is. So when in doubt, read your catechism. When in doubt, check the church teachings. That's the safest way to approach that. Now see that letter was in the North Country Catholic. It's in there today. Today, okay. Yeah. I, for one, I don't get the North Country Catholic, so if you had just read that to me, I wouldn't know that. I wish something like that was I'll send it to everybody. Catholic Thank social you. teaching. Yep. But I penalty. wish something like that would be printed in the local newspaper so everybody has a chance or I'll, you know. Good luck with more, that. I know, yeah. but more of the population to see it than when it's addressed you know, then I could we are that it. population. We are the way this teaching gets out there. That's what this course is about, really. I mean, if we're if we're to say that that after this yeah. Catholic social justice course and being commissioned, that we still don't feel that we have an active responsibility to go out and advance the teachings of our church, then I have failed you miserably. Because that's exactly what you're called to do. I can send you this article, which I will do. But when you read it, it clearly calls us to action, to live this. And to have an opinion, but an opinion that's an informed one based on church teachings. All right, let's take a break. That's going to give you time before the break to get together in your group. Um, and discuss your, your final presentation, if you will. Uh, you already have a leader, so it depends on how you want to present. There's four groups, so I would say probably 10, 12 minutes each should be enough time for a presentation, however you want to do it. I've given you the outline for that on your, your note. So you want to organize it in terms of what the problem was, what your strategies were, it's right on there. Your discussion lead you to a solution. You begin with a problem. You talk about the process.
that you went through in determining the scope of the problem. That's all the discussion you've had here in your groups. And you come to strategies. And you also bring up the planning problems you ran into. We wanted to do this, but we didn't have any money. We wanted to do this, but it was illegal. You know, we wanted to do this, but we thought we'd be excommunicated. I don't know. You put those kinds of things in there. That's what it is. And then at the end, I'm not looking for a, a shiny, brand new program that's going to solve the problem. What we're looking for from all these groups is that you, as a group, were able to take the problem you were given, analyze it appropriately, and using Catholic social teachings that we've been covering, develop strategies that reflect those Catholic social teachings. That's all I'm saying. There isn't going to be any, you know, uh, judging, no show of hands about how many think this is a dumb idea or whatever. None of that. Just looking. And then the last week, when I get into the theological reflection, I'm going to be talking about the pastoral cycle, sort of in reverse, to show you the process that you went through in doing this group work that you're doing. All right? And to not lose sight of the fact that all the strategies you're coming up with, all the work you're doing in groups, should be informed by prayer, theological experience of your church, and the teachings of your church. That guides your action. Okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Any questions? Leaders, you have to show up next week or we'll come to your house and we'll find you. <laughs> you know where you live. I got the addresses of everybody. You just get a big van out there, we'll come to Steve's house and say, <laughs> Didn't feel like doing it today. Yeah. Right. You're in trouble. <laughs> so, all right, let's close with prayer. In our Father. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.